Yeah. It did. No, it was good. <laughs> See, it's, it's Stacy. She's ruining it. She ruins everything. Yeah. But it's okay. That's part of her charm. You all had a nice break. I see the donuts are almost gone. Glad you liked them. So the, the, we're ready for our last presentation. This is Glenn Tozier. He is the digital systems librarian for Monterey Peninsula College. He's going to be going a little bit more into detail about password management, which I know Stacy touched on, and have you know that inspired a lot of people. Hopefully, uh, Glenn will bring it home. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're going to reduce terror. That's the uh, that's the objective here. So. Um, You'll have to forgive me. I spend a lot of time teaching community college students, so I'm probably going to talk as if I am teaching a community college class right now. But so um, just to start out with, just so I know whether or not I've prepped for nothing, how many of you guys use currently a password manager? <laughs> All right, we got one. Excellent. So OK, great. How many, then, are totally stoked and really like the idea of creating complex and unique <laughs> passwords for all of your different accounts? OK. Yeah. You guys are crazy. So password managers. I'm actually in a weird position right now because I kind of have the fervor of a uh, new believer when it comes to the use of pan password managers. Oh, computer went to sleep. Yep, there we go. Because um, I managed to have some of my credit card numbers stolen um, recently. And I suspect that it was because, at least possibly partly, because of my poor use of passwords. So th what happened to me, possibly, was that I had been reusing some passwords. How many people here have, at least in one part of their life, reused a password? <laughs> All right. All right. So that's obviously what we shouldn't do. And there were some very entertaining videos this morning that kind of gave us some of the reasons why. So let's see. All right. Yeah, what I thought was that I was smart enough, this wasn't going to happen to me. So basically, humans, in general, are terrible with passwords. We're, we are just not designed to interface with these machines that we made that require us to use passwords. So if you look online, you'll find lots of these fun little lists. They're usually put out by security companies. Like, so these, I think, are a collection of passwords that were leaked online with various data breaches that happened. And the one on the left is uh, most common passwords that were leaked in data breaches. You'll see that um, there's some patterns there. <laughs> and, <laughs> and over on the right side are some very terrible but very common passwords, like the word password. So we're just not designed to do this. And this isn't just us professionals, right? This is our kids, too. This statistic I was really surprised at. And it actually shows that if you look, the age range of 18 to 29-year-olds are actually the most likely people to be reusing passwords. Is that what this one is? Yeah, and that's just from this last year. As we get older, apparently we get better at not reusing passwords. I'm actually, this is happening to me currently. What did you say? <laughs> yes. Now, now. And this one right now, this pass, uh, can I make that bigger? I might make that bigger just because I was anticipating a widescreen 
but we have a small screen. This is the most common ways in which people are keeping track of their passwords here. And so we can see that the number one way was to memorize them in their heads, right? But we're not good as humans at memorizing complex passwords in our heads. Up there also is writing them down on a piece of paper, saving them in a computer file somewhere, an Excel spreadsheet full of all those different passwords to different things, saving them in the internet browser, which actually is not as terrible as it sounds. You know, Chrome, Firefox, they actually do have pretty decent password storage that is relatively secure, relatively. <laughs> and then down at the bottom there, using a password management program. So not very many of us use the tools that are available to actually store very, very secure passwords. So in the last one here, this is just a statistic of what kind of um, organizations were targeted with ransomware attacks, um, I believe, last year. I don't know if you can read it, but up at the very top are education institutions. And there's a lot of reasons for that. One of which is that we tend to have a little less money to spend on security. We also maybe have a lot of people employed who also maybe aren't very security minded. So us in libraries and educational institutions need to be very aware of our security. So it's not just on our day to day worrying about getting your credit cards stolen level. So really the answer to being able to use complex passwords, being able to change them, not have to write them down somewhere, is using something called a password manager. So I was going to show you guys two different password managers today, two which, both of which I'm using, because I think they're representative of the different types of password managers that are out there. So I'm going to go ahead and sit down at the computer and show you them. So I'll get out of the presentation here. So the first one that I want to show is this one called KeePass. KeePass is open source, it's very secure, and it's super lightweight, meaning that it's, it's a program that isn't going to bog your computer down. I mean, it runs on almost anything, right? Netbook, whatever. Not a Chromebook. So I've been using it now. When you open it up and you've created a basically a file filled with all of your passwords, you'll have to create a master password to gain access. So this is what that looks like. I'm putting in my very complex and long password. Relatively. And we basically come to a page where it has all of the different passwords that I've saved. So this one right here, this is a database passwords file. So these are my passwords to every single one of the databases at MPC that we use. Now the way KeePass works is it stores things, as I said, into a file. So this is very good. I'm using this for work. I go to work. I open up KeePass. It's got all of my passwords saved on that computer, right? So it's not quite as portable as others. But let me open up. I believe I made another one of dummy passwords. Yeah, for the presentation. This one is not cloud based. OK. So let's open up one of these guys and take a look at it. So got the title of the entry. Maybe the user, this is the username, and then the password itself. And so I'm just going to show you this password. Can you guys read that? Maybe if I click out of it. That is something long and complex. You can make that either, like maybe I did this one where I just kind of closed my eyes and did things on the keyboard, right? 
Or the other nice thing that um, KeePass does is you can generate passwords. So if you go over here, password, it just has some built-in ones. So I can say, I'm just going to do hex key 128. It'll change it. Change it again. Turn off the view. And it's saved, right? You would, of course, have to go to whatever account that is and change your password to that. That's one nice thing, is that you don't actually have to sit there and peck at the keyboard. So let's do that again. We can copy it go and change our password, et cetera. So I'm going to get out of here. So once you've loaded all your different accounts, and maybe actually I'll show you how to do a new one. Let's put a new key password in. So we'll add in a new password. So this one's for Joe's Volkswagen parts my username, and here I could just delete this and type in what my password actually is. And do it again. Or doing the smart thing, again, I could build a, build a secure one, go to Joe's Volkswagen parts and actually change my password there. So once you've built in all your passwords, oh, and you can also say, this is the place to go for new old stock electrical components. So once you've done that, you can take it and you can to actually sign into the places, sorry. So you would select it. You can right click and I can say URLs. Let's open this one in Microsoft Edge. Okay, so now we're on the page where I would sign in. Go back to KeePass, right click, and I'm going to copy the username. Right click and copy the password. And you'll notice that down here, it only copies on your clipboard for a very short amount of time. So that if you walk away from your computer, someone else hops on it, chances are they're not actually going to still have that password saved in the clipboard. Oh, oh. apparently I talked for too long. All right, there we go. And this is just a sample form that gives a pop-up and shows what I actually put in there. So that's the super simple way of using KeePass. That's basically the user level at which I am at currently. KeePass has a lot of other things. and has browser plugins that'll go ahead and fill out forms for you. I haven't done that. I am personally totally comfortable with copying and pasting usernames and passwords. So, before I move on from KeePass, does anyone have any questions about that specific password manager? Yeah. So the question was, is KeePass free or does it cost money? KeePass is free. It's open source, um, totally free, and it's also good open source. It's not just they're not trying to get something on your computer where it's harvesting information and sending it back. At least that's what I believe. Yes. Now, there's a couple things you can, oh, sorry, yes. The question was, does KeePass only work on the specific device that you have it installed? So yes, and there's a couple ways to get around that. They have, because it's so lightweight, you can actually just put it on a flash drive, keep it with you. Anytime you go to a computer, plug in and run it from that flash drive. You can also, and I've done this, keep the KeePass um, password files in a cloud system. Where, so for example, our campus uses Google for everything. So I keep my KeePass password vaults on my Google Drive. So any computer I go to that has the KeePass program, I could then open up those password files. 
and have all of it. So I have it at home and as well at work. So you don't have a program in the drive just the files. Just the files, yeah. And they apparently people, because it's open source, have made different versions of it that will run on phones and on different operating systems, et cetera. So you know, in theory, if you were adventurous, you could make it much more mobile than just what I'm showing here. So unless there's any other questions about KeePass, I want to show you a different one. And this is more representative of the more consumer, sometimes not free, password managers that have a lot more features. So let me go ahead and just close out of here. Yes, I'm going to save that one I just made. Close out of Edge. And I'm going to open up Dashlane. So Dashlane is a cloud-based password manager. And this is one where I'm actually paying, I think, $40 a year um, because I like the fact that it's cloud-based and that I can have it on my phone, I can have it on all my different devices, and it syncs up my passwords. Because it is in the cloud, and because it's on all these other devices, that probably makes it less secure. But, you know, price for convenience. So let me type in my super long and secure password. <laughs> no. I know. No, you can't see it. <laughs> My dog's name is Harley. <laughs> so KeePass has, uh, sorry, Dashlane has a lot more features. So I'm not going to show you all the different ones that I have in here, but I've made one under games just for today. Yes. Is that better? OK, cool. So what do we want to do here? Let's go to the website. So this is for a Google account. So it takes me to the Google login. Now I've installed a dash lane password um, plugin here. So that allows you to, oh, I'm going to sign out of that one. And we'll go back here and we'll go to the website again. sign in. There we go. We're going to pick this one. And when it loads, I should see this pop up. So this is from Dashlane. And it's basically saying, log in as that dummy account that I made for this. Logs me in. And we're in. Dashlane also does a lot of other things. So let's say that you know, the week has passed and it's time for my pass, weekly password reset. Let's go and reset my password. All right. Go to signing into Google. And because now the screen is a different, there we go, password. And look, I just did it yesterday at 9, 12 PM. So it's time to do it again, right? I put in my password again. OK, now it'll do a new password. So if I go up here to Dashlane, 
and go to this little dialog box that looks like a hash with an A. Oh, no, there we go. This is their password generator. And so I can tell it to only do letters. Maybe I don't want symbols. It's going to give me another password. Now let's do symbols again. All right, great. So let's copy that password to the clipboard. I'm going to put it in here. And I'm going to confirm it. It's also offering to generate a password right from the dialog box, but we're not going to do that. And we'll say change password. Now, what Dashlane is supposed to do, but it never does for me, <laughs> is actually then change it also within the client, uh, the, within the program here. But it rarely does that for me. So I'm actually going to go up here to the edit item. Here's all the different information. I'm going to go in here. I'm going to try and put a new one. There we go. And I'm going to say OK, because I copied it from the password generator. Dashlane really is, at that point in time, once I change my password, supposed to ask, do you want us to update this in your Dashlane account? And I should have said yes. But I can't figure out why it doesn't do that. But thankfully, unlike KeyPass, when you copy something into, when you copy a password into your clipboard, it doesn't go away. So the fact that I was talking while doing that didn't really screw me. OK. Let's go back to Dashlane. Adding new ones is a lot like doing it in KeyPass. You just go up, add new. It's got all these different accounts built in. So let's say that this was a, I don't know, let's do another Google account. Apparently, I don't know the alphabet. All right, I'm just going to do it here then. And maybe this was my login. Dogs are fun. And my current password, which is just one, two, three, four, five, six. I say OK. From here, uh, we're going to give it, you can associate with an email secondary login if there is one. You can give it a category. I'm going to give it games, because that's my demonstration one, and say OK. From there, you can go ahead and reset your password again. So that's the basic uses of Dashlane. Now, this is really similar to what I think is probably the most popular password manager, um, which, as soon as I said those words, escaped my mind. One pass, there we go. Yeah, it works very similarly. I've tried both. I picked this one because the interface is a little prettier on my Mac at home. Um, it does some other things, like if you go to your security dashboard, it'll tell you basically how you're doing. So I have 11 accounts. One of them's super weak. I haven't reused any of the um, passwords, and none of them are old. And I don't know how it would know whether or not any of them have been compromised but apparently none of them have. Oh, yeah, that's a weak password. That's the one we just did it with. So that's Dashlane. Does anyone have any questions about Dashlane? It goes out of business. Well, then I'm. What happens if Dashlane goes out of business? I might be up a creek. Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming that they would probably give me warning, um, considering that I'm a customer of theirs. So here's hoping. Um, but yeah, that's, that's one of the things that made me really wish that I was going to be able to use KeyPass on all my different, for all my different uses. But too often, I find myself somewhere and needing to log into, I don't know, my bank or to check on a credit card if it gets denied at a restaurant while I'm on a trip. And I couldn't really put KeyPass and make it work well on my phone. So that's why I chose one of these more commercially available password managers. Yeah. 
Um, in your research for this, did you find out anything about different um, different programs are using KeePass in kind of an institutional setting? You know, if you have a bunch of different people who have to use it, or any of these password managers, anything you found out? Yes. So not specific to Dashlane, but there are a lot of security companies out there that offer more institutional geared um, password managers. I don't know if there's anyone here that can maybe speak to that a little more, more intelligently than I can. I, I picked that one just for my personal use and using KeePass at work because of its advantages of being open source and being able to put it on a flash drive, et cetera. So when you're at work, are you the only one with the access to those KeePass files, or can other people who need to log into those same databases also? I mean, can you share that file? I, th I think, Stacy, yeah. did you say you were doing that? But Glenn should answer, because he has the mic. Yeah, so um, I could share that file. But as of right now, just because of the way we're staffed, I'm the only one with access to those. So yeah, um, I believe, Stacy, maybe you could answer this more intelligently than I can that you can have a single password file that multiple clients can go to? So we just remote into our drive and then access it that way. So we, um, in the systems department, we all have the same username and password when we log into it. And then we can pull, to log into KeePass, and then we can pull all of the 50 million emails that we have stored there. That's how we use it. I don't know of any enterprise. We don't use one on base. Um, that this is how we made it work because we just could not remember anything. I mean, I can remember everything. Yeah. <laughs> that leads to a question about when you have multiple people having access to the same login and password and you need to change the password, how do you communicate the new password to all the users? You should just email it, all users. <laughs> I'm joking. That's that's not what you should do. Post it on the wall. Yes. I ask because we have this come up a lot. So I don't know if I have a good answer for you. <laughs> yes, P. So one of the things that we one of the things that we do is we have the key pass, which doesn't also get changed that much because it is an internal thing, pretty secure. Um, and then we change it in KeePass. So for our ILS system, we'll change the username and password, and people can log into it. Um, I also go around and tell people mm -hmm. physically um, if, if they don't have access to that. But okay. also, you know, like when you have all these different accounts that everyone has to gain access to, using a password manager, especially in the way that, that you guys are using it at NPS, is one way to have the ability to change all these external passwords all the time, but the staff don't need to even know that it was changed because they're just going to key pass and copying the password. They don't, they don't care what it is. Is this thing on? I don't think it is. Oh, OK. Oh, I see. Um, if you generate one of these 40 digit passwords, can those be broken? Or do you need, or how often do you need to change those before they're vulnerable? So, rather than showing another one, um, yeah, anything can be broken. Yeah, I don't see. Exponential, yeah. Um, yeah. The question has to do with uh, lengthy passwords like 40 characters and how easily they can be broken. number of years to crack 
right? So like a nine character password could take five years to crack or, you know, a year to crack, whereas anything above like 20, they're saying, is almost virtually impossible to crack at this point, at this point. And I, I think what I was just going to say is that everything has vulnerabilities. Everything can be broken. We're just working to try and make it as inconvenient as possible. Happily. Yeah. And, and it would make a big difference if the 40 character password was like dog, cat, Bob, Frank, my birth year, you know, like, you know, all those things like that jammed together versus random characters. So this is a little bit off from passwords, but uh, I don't know if you're going to talk at all about token based authentication. I was not. Okay. <laughs> I was going to mention two-factor authentication. Okay. So it's just, just since token-based is a thing that is seen, it seems to be trending currently. I mean, you know, mo any bank website now, as far as I know, offers that as an option uh, in addition to, like, two-factor authentication. So I don't know if you had any opinions on that. I do not. Okay. And, and maybe I should have said this at the beginning. I'm a librarian. <laughs> I'm not, not a cybersecurity. Um, no, but, but one thing that everyone should be doing as well as using a password manager is using two-factor authentication with their personal accounts. Uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, if you just Google it, the Electronic Frontier Foundation has a great guide that shows how to, how to do two-factor authentication on basically every account that exists out on the open web. And for those of you who don't know, two-factor authentication is basically a two-step process to authenticating. So you might put your username and password in, and then it will send maybe a text to your phone with a numeric code in it that you would then need to put in. Or perhaps an email to a secondary email address that would allow you then to get a code from there and put that in. And so what that means is that for someone to have hacked your account, not only do they have to have your username and password, but they also have to be in possession of your phone or also have hacked your other email address. Now, if you reuse passwords, it's really easy to have hacked your other email address. So, but yeah, two-factor authentication. Two-factor two -factor authentication saved the, the butt of a friend of mine who lives in the Bay Area because somebody got his, into his bank account, but they didn't have his phone, so he was, he was totally fine. But he, like, multiple times within, like, the space of five minutes, he got the, the authentication messages from his bank. He was like, I'm not doing this. No. So. Oh, let me go there and put that cut. <laughs> I have a question. Um, we've talked about changing passwords often, but how effective is that really? So, because uh, if somebody's trying to crack passwords and such, it's something running in a matter of minutes at any given time, and it doesn't really matter whether your password is, you know, three years old or was changed last week, does it? What are the odds, actually, of uh, somebody um, getting your old password? So I, I would think, and it's my understanding, that using insecure passwords, short insecure passwords, and changing them all the time mm -hmm. is much less secure than using a long and complex password and maybe changing it less often. But changing your password is is important because oftentimes institutions may get hacked, you know, like, I don't know, maybe you did shopping at Target and they got hacked and your credentials maybe were leaked out for that account at that point in time, but maybe no one's acted upon it. Maybe they're still for sale somewhere on the deep web um, and you still are using a similar password somewhere else. If you had changed that in the meantime, then when someone finally buys that batch of authentication information from the Target hack, then yours will be changed. So that's my thoughts on it. Yeah, that's a good reason. Okay, thanks. Are you going to a different um, way of, instead of, you know, instead of using passwords, are there other different methods that, that will be, you know, uh, in the future employed, like, eye recognition or fingerprinting or something like that? So, yes. Like, already, if you have a newer iPhone, you can unlock it with your fingerprint. Although, what I've read about that is that it's a lot less secure than people may think. 
Um, you know, there's other different types of authentication that are currently in use. Uh, a lot of times, um, this is more enterprise-based, but they'll have like a physical key that you have to plug into computers to gain access to certain things. Um, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, facial eye recognition, that kind of stuff. Um, I would anticipate that that's coming, um, but I think we're stuck with passwords for at least the foreseeable future. That's, that's my understanding, if anyone knows better than I. Well, I just want to say, adding on to that, that what I've heard about that is it, maybe it's more secure, but if it does get hacked, then what do you do? Because you can't really get a new iris, right? <laughs> Whereas your password you can change if it gets, if it gets hacked some kind of way. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like, so it's like just, I mean, use a different finger on your fingerprint scanner. Oh, so I think cosmetic that's... Cosmetic surgery. Yeah, that's, that's one of the problems with biometrics. So if it does get hacked, then what? <laughs> it's like Minority Report where Tom Cruise is walking around with his old eyeball, right? <laughs> and I, just before I totally end, have a couple more thoughts that maybe have just occurred to me about password managers. I wanted to mention the mobile use of them. Um, so obviously on a phone, you're not going to have a very popular product that people are going to pay money for if you have to enter in a complex 16-digit password. So. One of the things I want to point out is to use this, in this case, it's Dashlane on your phone. You have to unlock your phone. Please have a lock on your phone. Um, and then to get into the app, you'll have to unlock it again. But again, those are just two short pins that you're using. So that is adding maybe a slight bit of vulnerability if someone steals your phone. Also, these commercial products like Dashlane, oh no, I didn't, hope, I didn't want that to expand everything out. Is this frozen? Oh, thank you. Um, is it all those browser plugins for these different password managers? Like, I actually specifically picked Dashlane uh, over um, OnePass because I had read that fairly recently OnePass's browser plugin had been hacked and was vulnerable. Um, does that mean that? The dash lines isn't? No, it doesn't. So all these added um, s uh, features for convenience of autofilling passwords, all those are offering other points of vulnerability. But you know, we're weighing convenience over security again. All right. Could you use the browser's password manager to manage your Dashlane password only? On your phone? I don't. Can you say that again? Instead of, uh, instead of having to enter your PIN twice to unlock your phone twice or whatever, um, and instead of entering your 16-digit Dashlane password, could you use a browser password manager on the phone to actually store the Dashlane? master password. I don't think so because you're accessing Dashlane. It's an actual application on the phone. Yeah. So. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.